Hello, my name is Alex Isles and welcome. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at Scandinavian DNA from the last 2,000 years. Welcome back. So as I said, in this episode, we're going to be looking at the DNA from Scandinavia over the last 2,000 years, and we're going to be using a piece of research done by a team led by Rodriguez Valera in 2023. Now this piece of research took 297 human remains in the last 2,000 years and analysed them to understand the genetic makeup of Scandinavia. And what they actually found was that there was inward migration to Scandinavia over the last 2,000 years and in some places a little bit surprising. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now to start off with, they divided up the human remains into periods that were analysed by dating, so often uh, carbon dating or dating by items. So they divided it up into pre-Viking, which was from 1 AD right the way through to 749, the Viking Age, which was 750 right the way through to 949, the Late Viking Age from 950 to 1099, the medieval period from 1100 to 1349 and then post-medieval 1350 to 1850 where they had the fewest human remains. Now when they did this they started to divide up the period and they wanted to compare the DNA they found. Now as I've mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon DNA episode there's um, modern DNA and there's ancient DNA, A-DNA. So what they wanted to do was they wanted to compare the A-DNA they found with modern population groups. So once they defined those periods, they wanted to then compare the ancient DNA, the A-DNA, so that's the DNA from the individuals from each of those time periods, with modern day sample groups. Now the reason why they wanted to do this was that those sample groups they thought, first of all, have been shown to be quite stable over a long piece of a period of time, and secondly, those would enable the researchers to basically say, all right, that DNA comes from this area, that DNA comes from this area, that DNA comes from this area, and we can start to get a picture of the migrations and the different groups that came into Scandinavia during those age groups. Now, when they've got those, what they did is they wanted to represent Britain and Ireland, obviously because of the connections in the Viking period and also pre-Viking period connections between Scandinavia and the British Isles and Ireland. Then they took Sardinia to represent Southern Europe. So modern day Sardinian DNA was used as a sample to represent Southern European DNA. And then they took Lithuanian DNA to represent Eastern Baltics, which had a lot more connection with um, Sweden over time. Um, for the British and Irish DNA, they actually used Monday Irish. And then from that, they compared the ancient DNA to 16,638 uh, samples from modern day Scandinavia. Now with all of that data, they started to see patterns. And the interesting thing about this was that they saw that, that both Denmark and Norway had lots of migration during the Viking Age and the late Viking Age, and even into the, uh, into the medieval period from Britain and Ireland. So for instance, in the Viking Age, nearly 50% of the DNA was from Britain and Ireland and also from Southern Europe, which is a really interesting one. Now the question with that is that Southern European DNA, is that representing people who had DNA from uh, the Roman period or is that also showing that the, in Denmark there were people migrating from Southern Europe to trade in maybe large trading towns, places like that. Whereas Norway saw mainly DNA from Britain Island being represented in the Viking period, the late Viking period and also in the medieval period as well. From these case studies, they actually found four individuals who were fully British and Irish. Now, two of these women, one of them was pre-Viking age, and the other one was late Viking age, and then the two men were both in the late Viking age period. So one woman from the late Viking age and the two men were buried in a very much a Scandinavian style, even though their DNA was fully uh, British and Irish from the sample. And the other woman, who was pre-Viking age, they put her down to being a direct result of the Adventus, that migration period where people came from southern Scandinavia and came into the British Isles. So they saw her as a sort of a counter-migration where someone from the British Isles had moved over into Scandinavia. And they also said there was a possibility of slavery. 
um, as well, which is a very complex issue during that period because we know that slavery existed in Western Europe. We know that the Vikings were famous for um, setting up slaving ports. In fact, you know, Dublin was one of the largest slaving ports in Western Europe when people were sold from all over Europe in Dublin and also around the British Isles as well. And then following on from that as well, we also know in the late Viking period, we see migration coming from the British Isles into Scandinavia to set up monasteries, help with the conversion to Christianity, and that sort of migration over there as well. And then at the start of the Middle Ages, you actually see a migration as well from Scandinavia into the British Isles, caused by cold periods where it was harder to live in places like Norway. So you see these really interesting periods where there is migration going to and from across the North Sea, and the connections are quite strong between those uh, those areas. Now when we've got all of this going on, we've also got to factor in a couple of other things as well, which makes this a little bit more difficult, and we can't just take the data at face value. First of all, and the paper does this really well to talk about it, is the fact that cremation was the fav favourite method of disposing of bodies in this period, especially in the pre-Viking Age and also in the Viking Age. So when we've got this, we might have a disproportionate amount of data of these human remains that have survived because of the fact they haven't been cremated. Now, with that being the case, we could see the data skewed because, you know, let's say uh, native Scandinavians may have just been cremated and therefore we will not see them within the data set because there's no human remains to test. And therefore the migrants who are coming into Scandinavia may be more visible due to the fact that they're not practicing cremation. So that's one thing that's clearly mentioned as a problem with the study and could be a long-term thing that needs to be studied in more depth and analyzed to try and see if there could possibly be some form of uh, ancient DNA taken from those cremation samples to help reanalyze. The other thing to take into account is that the Viking Age DNA and the late Viking Age DNA sees a large spike in the British and Irish segment. But they have actually used the Irish, um, modern Irish DNA to represent Britain and Ireland. Now this has some positives and this has some negatives. The positives are that we know that Scotland and uh, um, Wales and Ireland have that Iron Age British DNA from the pre-Roman period that's all quite similar that comes from the Bronze Age migrations into the British Isles. The downside of this is that in the south and the east of the British Isles, the people who we traditionally call the Anglo-Saxons who migrated in, they have different DNA to the um, British Iron Age population. But the funny thing about this is, is that their DNA cannot be separated from samples from the Netherlands in the same sort of early medieval period and also southern Scandinavia. So if there was migration from the British Isles into Scandinavia during the migration period, so you're looking at 400 to 600 AD or during the Viking Age, those people would, could be invisible. We wouldn't be able to pick them up because they would be genetically inseparable from those people in southern Scandinavia and in the Netherlands. So there's a really interesting one there is how much of the, let's say, the slavery or the, the migration would actually be invisible to us because we wouldn't be able to tell who was going backwards and forwards across the North Sea during that period. And so that's a really interesting one to factor in when we're considering about Scandinavian DNA because some stuff is visible, like someone with Irish DNA is visible because they are differently, different genetically to the population existing um, in Scandinavia at that period. Whereas someone who, let's say, would be what we traditionally call someone who's Anglo-Saxon would not be in southern Sweden, in Denmark, and in some areas of Norway, they would be seen as genetically inseparable and so therefore invisible genetically in the studies. Which is a really fun one where we're dealing with these complex issues because we have to think, all right, how much are we getting like a sample that is actually realistic? Or how much are we not getting a sample that's realistic? One of the interesting things about the woman who was 100% uh, British and Irish or that had that Irish DNA in the pre-Viking age is that she was buried with no grave goods. So they immediately presumed that she was a low status individual. Now, interestingly enough, actually in, in Northern Britain, in Scotland and in Ireland at this time, the tradition was not for burial with grave goods. So you see that uh, in Southern Scotland, in what we call uh, Pictland is being used as a term nowadays to mean the northwest of Scotland, in places like Ireland. Traditionally, because of the um, also 
uh, factors of Christianity, but also native traditions, grave goods was, was not used really. So she could just be buried in her homeland's traditions, and it doesn't mean that she's a low status individual. So there's a lot of stuff going on here where, you know, the idea of if you're buried with items and you're of higher status, that's also complex in its own way because different cultures have different ways of expressing status and different ways of expressing the importance of individuals within their society. So it's all very much fun. So even though we've got all of this amazing study, we've got 297 ancient uh, human remains that we're starting to study here in Scandinavia, we need more. We need more, we need uh, to cross-reference that with native traditions, we need to co uh, cross-reference that with traditions across in the British Isles, in also the Mediterranean and other locations, and see if we can find stuff that either stands out or is nearly invisible because of the fact that it's so similar. And then we can start creating more and more trends and understanding what's going on in this amazing period of the first millennium AD, when we've got that migration going on between, you know, the British Isles, Scandinavia, in Europe and also the Eastern Baltic to truly understand the Scandinavian world a lot better but also its impact on the surrounding world around it and get a better understanding of the DNA so that we can then find it in those other areas where the migration is coming to and from. So I really hope I've been able to open this up to you because it's an amazing fascinating bit of history and I'm really passionate about it but I'm hoping I'm helping you to become passionate about it as well. So I really hope you've enjoyed that episode, that you'll like and subscribe if you haven't already done so. And if you'd like to support me further, please do um, support me on Patreon or on Coffee because that helps me to put aside time for my YouTube videos. Otherwise, I look forward to you joining me in another video in the near future. And in the meantime, stay safe and well. Thank you very much.